Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Newhouse. I'm a retired obstetrician gynecologist and a board member for the UC Berkeley School of Public Health Alumni Association. It is my pleasure this afternoon to be able to introduce Dr. Christine Henneman, Henneman and Dr. Prachi Priam, who will be our moderator. So Dr. Hennenberg is a family physician and a graduate of the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. Before training in medicine, she received her BA in English, magna cum laude, from Pomona College, where she was also awarded the Dole Kinney Prize in Creative Writing. Her writing on abortion has appeared in the New York Review of Books, the New York Times, Boston Review Slate, The Point, The Millions, and elsewhere. Her memoir, Boundless, An Abortion Doctor Becomes a Mother, has been called engaging, thoughtful, and tragically timely. She li lives in the Bay Area with her husband and has two young children. This session is gonna be moderated by Dr. Prachi Priyam. She was born in India, raised in the San Francisco East Bay. She first trained in anthropology and public health before turning towards clinical medicine. These initial years of work on healthcare access for homeless communities in New Delhi, India, and then in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, solidified her interest in family and community medicine. She serves as a national working group member for White Coats for Black Lives and has prioritized engagement with local community organizing in each of these places she has lived and worked. She aims to always practice abolitionist, anti-racist and decolonial medicine, bringing these perspectives into her work as both a hospitalist and as a reproductive justice-centered abortion provider. I'm going to turn this over to our panel and we will save our questions for the end of the session. So uh, panel, take it away. Thanks, Dave. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks Prachi for um, being here with me. I feel like uh, for as closely as we work together in theory, I don't get to see you and talk with you very often. So I'm really looking forward to this hour together. Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, as I think Dave said, I'm just going to begin uh, before we get into more of a back and forth between me and Prachi about our work and about um, the book and some of the issues raised in the book. I'm just going to begin by reading for a brief time, like less than 10 minutes uh, from the book. Usually I start in something like this by reading from the very beginning, but um, I think this audience is advanced um, and familiar enough with some of the, just some of the issues and the material that I'm gonna actually jump in toward the end of the book. Um, the book is structured by the weeks of pregnancy. Um, in this case, the weeks of my own first pregnancy, which coincided with my first year uh, practicing independently as a doctor and as an abortion provider. Um, so I'm starting us at uh, the beginning of the chapter 30 weeks, and uh, I'll jump forward a little bit Toward, to the end of the chapter to a patient story that's there. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background, like medical background information in between at that jump, but otherwise I don't have any context to provide, so I'll jump right in. 30 weeks. I keep all the baby things stacked in a corner of the garage, high chair, car seat, bassinet, stroller. Hidden under a white sheet, they make a strange mountainous form next to our bikes and Costco packs of toilet paper. Mo went in there the other day to get a light bulb. Isn't that a bit much, he said. What, I said, looking up. I was reading on the couch, my feet stretched out in front of me and propped on two pillows, my book resting on my belly. I could see him choosing his words carefully. I know you don't want all the baby stuff all over the house, but uh, the sheet, it's kind of morbid. It kind of looks like, you know, like somebody died. I shrugged, turning back to my book. It'll just have to look that way for now. Later that same day, my friend Toby called me. She and her wife Kirsch have been trying to conceive for four years with donor sperm. During that time, she's watched a dozen of her friends get pregnant and give birth. She was breathless on the phone. Chrissy, she said, I have news. Toby is a violinist, opera singer, and private music teacher in San Francisco. I've seen her teach. 
She is animated and encouraging, the kind of music teacher who throws open the door and welcomes each student as though they're her favorite, squeezing their little shoulders in a hug. At the end of the lesson, she sends them out with a triumphant pat on the back and a plea to get in their 30 minutes of daily practice. Each one of those kids probably believes they could perform at the Met if they wanted to. I'm pregnant, she told me. And for half an hour, I did nothing but congratulate Toby and listen as she recounted the details. She'd just gotten the result of her second blood draw, which showed a rising beta HCG level, the pregnancy hormone. She is barely in her fifth week, too early even for an ultrasound. We're naming her Juniper, she announced. While we talked, I paced the backyard, feeling the now familiar movements under my ribcage, looking down at my feet in the grass, barely visible beyond my bulging abdomen. Toby and I haven't talked much in the past six months. I haven't told her I'm pregnant. I didn't tell her on the phone that afternoon either. Toby is a soprano. She likes to be the center of attention. I didn't want to take away from her triumphant moment. Actually, I hardly told anyone. Our parents and sisters, of course, some close friends, and some acquaintances I've made swimming laps at the pool. Impossible to hide it there. More people are starting to notice, though. Over the past few weeks, my colleagues at work have started asking me. Even my loose scrub tops now make a conspicuous tent over my belly. At first, I was nervous about what my abortion patients would say when I started showing, but they always expressed genuine happiness for me, even in the midst of their own difficult decisions. Girl, you are going to love that baby, one mother of three said to me before her procedure. Another woman, 19 years old and ending her first pregnancy, smiled at me through her tears. It's your time, she said. I'm just jumping ahead toward the end of the chapter now. Um, the bit of background information I wanna give you here is that um, I'll refer to something called osmotic dilators. Osmotic dilators are um, self-expanding inserters or inserts that we place in a woman's cervix the day prior or two days prior to a second trimester abortion, generally 16 weeks or later. Um, these expand and open the woman's cervix overnight so that we're able to remove what are generally larger and more rigid fetal parts through the cervix uh, in a day or two. The other thing to know about the dilation of the cervix is that a pregnant cervix is, um, for pregnancy that is intended to continue, is supposed to stay closed. So we generally do not dilate a pregnant cervix unless the intention is to uh, relatively soon remove the pregnancy. Um, a dilated cervix with a pregnancy that's intended to continue is not a good thing. Um, so that's the background. Words are the most difficult and important thing. And the procedure itself, of course, do no harm and all that. It's mostly easy to avoid harm with my instruments. Even mistakes, perforation, bleeding can be fixed. The importance of words is part of what drew me to this work. A pregnant woman needs a doctor who respects language, who will choose words carefully, help her write a story that she can live with, even be proud of. I still believe that. But like everything these days, it's getting more complicated. The other day, there was a patient on the schedule for a 17-week abortion. She'd had six osmotic dilators placed the day before. But she didn't want the abortion anymore, one of the counselors told me. She wants you to take the dilators out and leave the pregnancy inside. I called her into my office, a large empty room with a computer and a few gurneys where patients sometimes slept while they waited for their procedures. She was in her mid thirties, older than me. She wore a tight maroon tank top, rolls of pale doughy skin bulged from under the straps and around her armpits. A few tattoos lined her arms. Her dark, damp hair was pulled back in a ponytail. Tell me what's changed for you since yesterday, I said. She explained that her husband had been in prison for over a year and had gotten out on parole last week. In the meantime, she'd become involved with another man and was now pregnant. Her husband had moved back in with her, he owned the house, and wanted her to end the pregnancy, so she'd come to the clinic yesterday to start the process. She looked up at me, her jaw tight and determined, but you know what? I got home last night with those things inside me and something just didn't feel right. 
I don't mean just my belly cramping. I mean, something emotional. I sat down and I thought about it real hard and I thought to hell with it. My husband, he's always coming and going, letting me down. Shoot, he'll be back in prison next year. I wouldn't be surprised. Then what? She shook her head. No, this time it's my decision. This is my baby and I wanna keep it. I took a deep breath, treading carefully. Yesterday, I said, you signed some papers saying that you understood the risks of the procedure, including the risks of not coming back to finish it today. Right, she said, I know, that's why I came back. I just wanna be clear that the procedure, the abortion has already begun. When I take out those dilators, your water could break. Even if it doesn't, your cervix will stay open. That's dangerous for the fetus and for you. You could bleed, you could go into labor at any minute, the fetus would be too small to survive. You could get an infection in your uterus that would spread to the fetus. You could also die. I know that, I know it's all in those forms. I read the forms. And you still want me to do this, I asked. Look, like I said, I wanna do everything possible to save my baby. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least I'll know I tried. Not once did I use the word baby with her. This was one of the first principles of abortion care that I had learned in medical school. It is a pregnancy, an embryo, a fetus, not a baby. In this case, I probably could have said it. She may have even wanted me to say it, but I felt that it would be a lie. I took her back to the procedure room and placed the ultrasound on her belly. I'm just checking on the fluid first, I said, and the heartbeat. Oh, I know it's still alive, she said. I can feel it moving. And so I did what she'd asked me to do. I placed the speculum and found her cervix. The dilators peeked out at me like baby birds snuggled in a nest. I grasped one with small forceps, pulled gently. It came out easily. I grasped the next one, the next, the last. Her cervix gaped at me, wide and soft, but the amniotic sac didn't break. I removed the speculum. Okay, I said. Done? Yes. She pulled her legs together. I checked one more time with the ultrasound. Can I see it, she asked. I turned the screen toward her. The fetus was curled in profile, its heart pounding at 150 beats per minute. A little hand seemed to flatten against the screen as though reaching for its mother. Suddenly she let out a sob of relief, so wrenching and surprising, I felt my own eyes well up. She squeezed her eyes shut and the tears ran down her face. I reached for her hand. Thank you, doctor, she said, looking up at me. Thank you for saving my baby. Sometimes there is no right thing to say or do. I never believed I was saving a baby. I believed this poor woman would, and by now I believe she probably did, experience a preterm delivery of a non-viable fetus or perhaps a severely disabled infant. I made it clear that this was what I expected and feared for her, and she still made her decision. She still called it my baby. In a way, she reminded me of Toby, how overjoyed and open she was from the first moment when her pregnancy was nothing but two points on a graph, a doubling of her hormone level. The way she named it before she'd even had an ultrasound, the way she talks about it every time I call. She calls it her, she calls it Juniper. Meanwhile, I am 30 weeks pregnant and still keep the stroller and high chair in the garage under a white sheet. Now I wonder if I was wrong. Not in what I did for that woman, but in what I said. I think about the words she used, the words I used. I think she wanted me to call it that, her baby, but I wouldn't. It still makes me ache to think of it. i stop there. And um, I guess Prachi and I will discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just thinking about the coincidence because we have touched briefly on discussing about language and this was actually this last part of what you read was what I was looking at too is something that I wanted to start off our discussion with so that worked out really well. Um, I think a lot about how you're coming to words as both a physician and a writer there's so many steps we take before we move on to performing um, a procedure, in this case, abortions. And there's so much language there 
There's so much language to make sure that our patients understand the risks and benefits, um, everything that comes along with going through a procedure. And then you're also coming to words as a writer. And that's such, um, such a powerful and unique position to be in. And I want us to kind of, I'm hoping that we can start off by discussing that, but also if you're open to it, kind of discussing that this moment, this interaction, this patient encounter had such a large impact on you. You included it in this book. Um, I wonder if you ever imagine how you might do things differently, specifically how you might approach this now. Yeah, um, thanks. That's a, okay, that's a super question. And I'm gonna ask you about it too, because I think that's part of being a physician in any field is, I mean, I know that it's part of being a physician in any field is um, changing your practice with experience um, and also with changing science. But uh, yeah, this practice of how we speak to patients, I agree, it's so um, critical, especially in this field. I mean, I think, you know, there's also a, an important point to make that like in every field, uh, in any procedure an informed consent process happens beforehand. So I don't wanna give um, audience members the impression that this is somehow like emotionally, it's a more fraught um, thing for patients, I think than most medical procedures, but certainly not all. Um, and it's nothing different that like the idea of informed consent is nothing different um, than when someone comes in for a gallbladder removal. Um, this is why we're doing this. This is why, you know, in an elective pre procedure, you've asked for me to do this. Um, and these are the risks and these are the benefits. So, so that part is, um, that part we're trained to do from a clinical perspective. Um, and it can still be done well or done poorly. But I think with the abortion procedure, you know, it's so important. Like, I think how it, these conversations have changed over time is that I think in the beginning, at least for me as an inexperienced provider, um, I saw the difficulty in women's um, emotional responses in these conversations as some kind of warning sign, like, uh oh, she's not sure, or uh oh, I don't want to be coercing her. Like, the bottom line is that uh, I think that kind of response is really trained into us from an anti abortion perspective, like the idea that women are not sure or not good decision makers, or that abortion is something that happens to women because evil abortion doctors coerce them into it. Like that's just not the case. The a number of barriers between this woman and me, even in the state of California is great. And by the time she's sitting there on the procedure table, like, yeah, it's not because I've coerced her to be there. Um, and any difficulty um, or ambivalence she might have in that moment um, I trust her to hold that and to still make a decision. And, you know, in this woman's case, like she made a decision and then she made a different decision. And I think that was such a powerful growing moment for me as a physician to understand that like decision-making is not always straightforward. These decisions are big decisions. They're complicated decisions. Actually, the fact that a woman might wrestle to that degree is not a sign that, um, rather I should say, uh, it's a sign of how much I can trust her that I can say like, okay, you understand the risks and the benefits of starting an abortion procedure, stopping an abortion procedure partway through. And I trust you to make that decision. It's not for me to try to persuade you other than to offer you my medical advice, which I you know, very clearly did in this case. So I've seen patients like this since then. Um, it does not happen very often, but I've seen probably two more. Um, and I've also spoken at one point with a maternal fetal medicine doctor who, um, I, to whom I referred these patients um, for a close follow-up um, as they continue their pregnancy. And I ended up having a conversation with one of those doctors who said, you know what? I take the same approach as you. Like they've heard the warnings, all those warnings you told her, she heard them. She still made this choice. Now it's my time to take as good a care of her as I can. And he said, I'm actually like, try to be really optimistic and um, not give them false hope, but just like give them any hope I can because that's their decision and they've made it. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. But I think in short, over time, I've leaned more towards 
more always towards trusting my patients, um, including the language they use and um, the decisions they make, even if they're not necessarily the decisions I think are best medically for them. What about you? Like, how have you, um, how do you think your like relationship to language and talking to patients has changed over time in the years you've been providing abortions, Prati? Um, also agree, such a wonderful question. And I think it's, it's almost hard for me to think about what I spoke like before I was a physician, like a practicing physician and what I speak like now with my patients. It's, it's almost like it was a different life and world and I wasn't involved in people's lives to the point where things that I said, recommendations that I made would necessarily make a large difference in their lives. Um, in terms of like, say things like research work. Um, um, I think what I like to focus on, well, I think what we're trained to do and teach, which is the program that we've both um, kind of trained out of, um, in teach, you know, we learn to emphasize and center what a patient wants, what the words that they use. And I, I, and I like to think that I follow that. Um, and if there's ever any concerns about expectations um, about a procedure, medication, anything that I kind of mirror their language. Um, and I think that reflects in body language as well as the words that I'm using. Um, but that's kind of what I lean towards. The things that this made me think more about, like think about in addition to what you've mentioned are, are a couple of things. Uh, one is this concept of risk, which I've thought a lot about over the last couple of years because how do we kind of define what risk is and how do we adequately explain that to our patients? Because there's risk in action and there's risk in not acting. Um, and that's a conversation I really appreciate having with my patients. And I'm, I'm curious as to how that concept has evolved for you because even when I think about things like pregnancy, do we really talk about the risk of what it means to like go to the, like to complete a pregnancy, to yeah. deliver a child, like what is the risk associated with that? And same thing, like when it comes to like the actual point of delivery, like when we talk about the risks of say having a C-section, if it's indicated or something that we recommend, what is the risk of having a C-section versus having a vaginal delivery? So, and that again applies to earlier in a pregnancy when someone is making a decision about whether they want to continue our pregnancy or not, you know, trained to say, and the data shows that a uh, first trimester abortion is 10 times safer than carrying a pregnancy to term, more than 10 times safer uh, in a lot of the data. So I'm curious to know what your language around risk is like um, as well, because I think now more than ever, as we're kind of dealing with all of the restrictions that continue to pass um, across the country, that conversation about risk takes on a whole new light and importance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a whole other, um bend in the conversation. And it's um, just a couple brief thoughts. One is that um, I think it's true. People in kind of everyday discourse don't talk much about um, the risks of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, so carrying a pregnancy to term and giving birth. Um, we are, I think those of us in the public health circles are hearing more about this now in terms of um, risk disparities. So the absurdly elevated risk of maternal and child mortality for um, a black woman in this country compared to a white woman, regardless of controlling for many other factors. Um, so that, you know, that uh, is a very useful place to start the conversation. And you can even take it to a more basic level of like, oh yeah, it's risky to be pregnant and give birth. Um, I do think and talk about this all the time in the sense that um, in my counseling with patients, when I go over the consent form, which I do actually fairly briefly, because they have a whole form they can read themselves. I trust them to read that form. They don't need me to read it to them. But what I say is, you know, these are the risks of the procedure. They're very minor. Um, in fact, they're much less than the risks of carrying a pregnancy to term and giving birth. Um, so I, it's important to me for our patients to hear that. Um, the other point that I'll make is that there is no quantifying risk um, within 
in a woman's life, non-medical risks and all the things that she's weighing in this decision, um, which I think, you know, are not only obviously greater to her risk of um, the impact on her family, on her finances, on her career, her education, her safety, um, the risks of having a child. Like, I think a lot of times those far outweigh her concern about the medical risks of like, oh yeah, then childbirth, like that can be complicated and dangerous sometimes, um, let alone, you know, the risks of this extremely um, brief and safe procedure. Um, and it gets so conflated, you know, like in, as you point out, like in the conversation today, people can throw out the word risk and it's supposed to um, stand for something intolerable. Like I read today that the um, some of the language in the um, Fifth Circuit case that's now being you know used to likely restrict uh, severely restrict the use of mifepristone at least for now. Um, that you know mifepristone is considered um, is a risky drug. These doctors who wrote the suit claim because it causes severe bleeding and cramping and pain, right? Like <laughs> it causes a miscarriage. Like that's what it does, you know. And that's like to use that that that's dangerous to to take the language and twist it to frame that as a risk. Like that's what women actually go through every month <laughs> with menstruation, and that's what a miscarriage is. That's not a risk, that's an intent. So it's, um, yeah, it is a fraught, like so many other words, it's become so fraught um, specifically in this topic. Um, which actually what you were just uh, saying towards the end there also makes me think of the other thing that um, what you, the, the piece of your book that you read made me think of, which is um, something, I also think about every day, and I'm sure you do too, but this concept of reproductive justice and, and how it's unique from this concept of reproductive rights and the idea of reproductive justice, not to define it in its entirety, um, but the core components of it include the idea that um, a person has a right to choose when to have a child, when not to have a child, but also to raise a child with the support that is required in a supportive community, um, with the financial resources, with the social supports. Um, to, to raise a healthy child and a, raise a healthy family. And I think that also really speaks to the patient encounter you've described, right? Where, um, and also the different types of non-medical risks that people face on a daily basis, like birthing uh, people face on a daily basis. And what, what are your, have your thoughts kind of changed recently on that or how do you kind of incorporate that into your practice? Um, of course, a large part of that can come into the consent, but even like just in how you interact with patients, how you how you perform your procedures, all of the above, your entire practice. There is, okay, that's a big question, um, but in terms of answering it, because um, I think it's an important one and it does come up through um, the part I just read. And then I think in many of the um, stories that I wrote, I tried to look back at them through a frame that I, through a reproductive justice frame that I had as I was writing, although I was still growing in it and I'm still growing in, um, right, you know, cause it requires me stepping out of my privilege and thinking like, this is how I had always thought about um, my life course, what my life will look like, my choices and privileges and opportunities um, in this case, specifically pertaining to uh, planning a family, starting a family, being a mother, um, and instead um, remembering that all people that I care for should have the right to those same opportunities, privileges, choices, and very often do not. And how does that difference between us sometimes color my perception of them? Um, and how can I make sure that I see that and remove that lens and um, talk to them like any, talk about, to them and think about them like I should any person who wants to have a child, which is you have a right to have a child when you wanna have a child and to anyone who doesn't want to have one, you know, that's your right also to make that choice. What I'm saying here is that like, um, you know, some of the language in that passage of what I saw in this woman sitting across from me, she is a little bit older than me, she looks, you know, for lack of a better word, I describe her as looking kind of sloppy. Um, she's kind of, her skin's bulging out of her tank top. She's got tattoos on her arms, her hair, she's hair's in like a wet ponytail. 
And all the judgment that I can bring to that, and if I'm not careful, I do look at this person who's so different from me and how that might impact the way I counsel her, the way I even think about her ability to make choices, um, make choices that are good for her, as opposed to me and my ability to make choices that are good for me. Me, the doctor who's gone through medical school and um, you know, who's been trained to counsel women in decision making, like no way, you know, like I have to leave all of that out of it and listen to what she's telling me and try to put aside, try to both consider and then put aside all the ways her life is different from mine and think, what is she telling me? She's telling me she's made this choice. She's asking for my help. And that's it. And it, so that's, I mean, you know, that's, that's long of an answer it is. It's an answer to a small part of your question. But to me, that's um, whether it's, you know, a difference of class or race or um, language, immigrant status, whatever it is, all these ways that my patients can, I can see them as so different for me and their choices are so different from mine. To me, the reproductive justice lens is you've got every right to have or not have kids at any time, just like me. I trust you to plan and make those decisions for yourself. Now tell me how I can help. That's, so that's how I think of it. Um, I'm curious what you would add um, or maybe subtract from what I've said. No, I, I mean, I think that's a wonderful explanation because you, I mean, that's what you're grappling to me as, as a reader. I feel like that's what you're grappling with throughout um, the book itself, which is putting forward what you experienced. Um, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that a lot of the pieces that are in here uh, were written while you were like from your journals, right? So I, on one hand, I'm, I wonder like what type of experience that is because clearly your, um, your thoughts, your practice has, like they both have changed as, as you've matured into an attending physician. Um, but at the same time, what is that process like? I, and I don't mean to ignore the reproductive justice question. I, I want to come yeah. back. <laughs> but like, right, I, I want to also think about um, the thing that kind of um, stuck out in my mind, which is you're, you came back to these words and you parsed through them. And what, what is that experience like? To Because when I think of some of the things that I said or did when I was younger or at, at any point, even like say six months ago, I'm like, <laughs> oh, wow, I can't believe I said or did that. But coming back to, to these things, like you said, when you are recapturing what you saw as a trainee, for example, what, what was that process like? Uh, it was humbling. <laughs> it was really humbling. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think writing is a lot of things for me when it comes to medical care specifically and my practice. Mm -hmm. I say in the book that writing is a way that I have to spend more time with my patients. I still see it that way. Cause you know, like, you know how it is where you're like, you're going fast, you're going fast. You have to keep going, the patients keep coming um, and you're doing the best you can under the circumstances that the um, American medical system, as we call it, allows for us. Um, and it's not as good as it could be if you had the time. So I use my writing as a way to spend more time with my patients. And to me, that's what makes me a better doctor. Mm -hmm. That's what gives me more time to reflect. Um, and if it's not something that I can go back, you know, I mean, I think you train so that you can give good medical care and not make big mistakes when you're working in a rushed way, but you don't have much time to learn and reflect and become a better doctor when you're rushed. So I think that's when I become a better doctor um, and think about how am I gonna do it differently next time? And yeah, that comes from like seeing, um, you know, already at this point, even stuff that's in the book, um, not the stuff I wrote in their self-reflective mode, but like the stuff that I wrote as my truth that I then put in the book. I'm already, I read it and I'm like, ooh, that's not quite what I, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that's how you grow as a writer too. Um, and uh, yeah, and of course there's other, other people have different ways as a doctor to reflect and to get better. But for me, it's writing and it's reading back over um, what I've read in the past. And it's allowing myself to be yeah. seriously humbled in the process yeah I often I often say that about when I'm writing even just my patient notes that words are how, how I process it's where I have the epiphanies about a patient case when I'm writing things down yeah. I'm like oh that makes so much more sense so 
I appreciate that idea of how it's, even though we may not be in the physical presence of our patients, it's a way that we can still reflect on um, how we may have done things differently or just even done things correctly at the end of the day um, when we catch something that we otherwise may not have expected ourselves to catch. Um, and then thinking about reproductive justice to kind of jump back to that, I think for me, reproductive justice with its definition, um, you know, embodies, it also includes the power of bodily autonomy, includes the idea of choice. And, and to me, choice is what the person in front of me has decided for themselves. And what I tell my patients is that I make recommendations, but at the end of the day, no one is going to do something to you that you don't want to have done to you. That is my goal as a physician, that I never put a patient in a place where they experience something to the best of my ability that they don't want to. And it's not always possible to 100. I mean, I think it is possible to 100%. And we are, however, working in a system, as you said, that doesn't always allow things to go in the way that we as physicians might want for our patients and what our patients want for themselves um, as well. So I think my goal is to honor a patient's choice as a form of being a provider who believes and wants to perform and provide care in a reproductive, like in a just way. And then also recognize that there are parts of the work that I do that may never be just even in my lifetime in the future because we're working in, in inherently unjust systems. Um, so yeah, I haven't articul articulated it quite like that before, but I think that that's how I'd think about it. Um, and then the other things that this makes me think about are, um, did you do values clarification when you were training? Um, we should define what that is, but yeah, I mean, yeah. early, early on, early on, but you can probably, you're closer to it than I can. You've probably led some of them. So you should define what that is. <laughs> sure. I haven't led a proper values clarification myself yet, but I have um, sat through them and for our audience, basically a values clarification is something that um, I, I believe most teach programs, if not all of them. Um, so teach is the program that um, trains family medicine residents uh, primarily in the Bay Area, but also in other parts of the country now, um, that teaches um, family medicine residents the skills to provide early, early abortions, um, generally below 14 weeks gestation in a pregnancy. So at least in our residency program, what we did was we were asked a series of questions that really ask us to think about what we, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, at any point. But yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that sounds familiar. So we're asked to think about different scenarios and how that impacts how we feel towards a patient encounter. Um, the things that are most memorable for me and actually come up in your book as well are questions, say, about, say, a patient comes in and says that they are having an abortion because um, they don't want a child that's a boy or a girl. So they're, they're making a, a sex selection. Mm -hmm. Does that change whether you would perform the abortion or not? So it, these exercises help you really hone in on the ethical quandaries that may come up when you become an abortion provider. Um, and it's something that we did a couple of times in residency, um, especially if we chose to, we may have done something a bit more intensive when we um, decided to become or express our intent to actually become an abortion provider after residency. And, and I'm thinking about that because so many of, um, some of those situations come up in your book. Oh yeah. And they absolutely change. My answers to at least a couple of those scenarios have changed just in the couple of years um, since I started performing and learning about abortion. So I'm curious to know if you have thoughts about that. And it's kind of related to what we spoke about earlier in terms of how your practice and your language has changed, but um, you have some really powerful patient kind of case, like not cases, but patient encounters that you talk about. And, and all of them have some ethical, um, can like prick some ethical questions for folks who are reading it, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's a lot of why I chose to include some of the, the stories I chose. Um, because, because they raise those questions and they can tell you in the book, they tell you at least in that snapshot in time, how I was thinking about it. 
Um, so one that I wrote about in the book is a woman who kind of mid procedure, basically at a point in the procedure um, where I'm already half the abortion's already half done, um, mentions offhandedly that she already has um, you know a couple girls at home, and this time she wanted a boy, and she makes a comment that makes it very clear that she was never even actually informed of um, the fetal sex, but kind of using an old wives tale had determined for herself that this one um, was not the sex that she wanted um, and uh, decided to abort for that reason. And in the story, I'm like horrified. I mean, it brings up all kinds of issues, you know, um, but if you take just the idea of sex selection alone, um, you know, it, it brings up just that more simple question of like, well, is that an okay reason to have an abortion? Is that an accept is that acceptable for me as a provider um, to provide that abortion? And I don't know what I would have answered you at the time when I was kind of, yeah, horrified mid procedure at um, this woman's kind of misconceptions and what I thought maybe, um, again, decisions I didn't necessarily agree with. Now I can tell you, um, I believe that an abortion is a woman's choice regardless of what the reason is. Um, you know, people may balk at that at first and say, oh, you know, but that's so heartless and, you know, to choose a boy or a girl or to think that's a reason to have an abortion. And to that, I just say, you know, if you think that that should be restricted, that that kind of abortion should not be allowed, then how is that different from laws on the books in many states prior to the overturn of Roe v. Wade that abortion was allowed, but not for, um, pregnancies that had been diagnosed as um, having Down syndrome or other genetic anomalies that, you know, that that was not an acceptable reason to have an abortion. And if you start picking apart what are the acceptable reasons um, by one person's values or ethics um, and not by the values and ethics and choices of the person carrying the pregnancy, basically for any other reason, to me, that's where things go wrong. Um, to me, the value of the pregnancy is defined by the person carrying it. Um, and that includes the reasons for having an abortion or for carrying the pregnancy to term. Um, and that clarification, which came, is not my own idea, it has come from the help of many other you know, thinkers um, and writers, but that is really what I believe in. And so it applies to many different aspects and reasons for abortion, including the gestational age, from as early in the pregnancy to as late in the pregnancy um, and the reason, um, basically for any reason that a woman comes in, she doesn't have to tell me, but if she does, it doesn't impact my um, feelings about the service that I am providing for her. We, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, if there's people in the audience who would like to send in their questions, I will forward them on to our panelists. But I have a quick question for both of you. What do you think will be the long-term impact on the field of reproductive rights um, in states where they're outlawing this procedure? I mean, are doctors going to OBGYNs and family practice doctors going to be leaving the state? Will residency programs suffer? What do you think, how do you see the long-term uh, impact playing out? Either one of you can answer it or both. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you should, I mean, I think we could both talk about this for the entire rest of the hour, but I'll let you start, Prachi, with what's most concerning to you. Uh, I, I think we're already seeing the impact of that just in the most recent match cycle that happened, um, what, about a month ago? There was already a lot of discussion about where um, medical students were choosing to train for residency or even um, before that, where people are planning on going to medical school because if you can't train in something so fundamental to what you might want to do um, that you're supposed to learn about in, in medical school, but more so residency, then uh, I think it's already dramatically impacting that and it's already impacting access as well for patients. So um, how long that impact is going to last, uh, I don't know. I'm not good at guesstimating, but I think we're already seeing um, major impacts from all of these decisions that have been happening over the last um, couple of years now. Yeah, and I'll um, say what I, I think I say over and over again to my um, friends and colleagues who I have these discussions with regularly. You know, I think people often ask providers like me and Prachi, you know, so gosh, like what's it like in California? You must be seeing so many people coming from other states. 
Um, and that's just horrible. And I agree, it is horrible. Um, whenever I see a patient, which I do every time I work now, um, who's traveled from another state, I feel terrible for them that they had to go through that. And um, you know, I'll say over and over, those are the lucky patients, a patient who can get herself to California, whether it's the money, the time, the kind of like safety and security in her relationships and people who support her in making that trip. I mean, those are the lucky patients. So that sucks that they had to make that trip. And I am so glad that they are there. And I am so angry that, you know, what abortion has become is something available to the most privileged few. Um, the patients I worry about are not the ones that make it to my clinic. Um, they are fine, right? That sucks, but they're fine. Um, it's the ones who are never making it out of their state, sometimes not even their home. Um, those are the patients that I, yeah, I think about and worry about the most. And just to kind of add a little bit onto that, is just that oftentimes we think of California as a state that has everything together, and I'm sure not all of us agree with that, but at the same time, even accessing an abortion in California is pretty difficult, even before the Dobbs decision came out. Access is such a complicated question. It includes things like trust in medical systems. It includes uh, insurance status. It includes geographic accessibility. And uh, yes, California may have more rights um, right now for um, the people who live here and people who are traveling here, but that does not necessarily make California a state with across the board easy access uh, to abortion or reproductive health and education services. So we have a question here. Um, if a woman lies about her due date to get an abortion, how does that affect the procedure? Oh, that's a, um, that's a great, question, um, and it has a fairly straightforward answer. Um, before the advent and regular availability of ultrasound, I mean, so what this person's essentially asking is, you know, what if a woman is more pregnant or less pregnant than you think she is um, when she comes in for a procedure? And the procedure is, um, can look quite different in early pregnancy versus late in pregnancy. And so the answer is that before the advent of ultrasound, um, that could be trickier. We have ways to assess, um, the dates of a pregnancy and the size of a pregnancy by physical exam. Um, they were not as nearly as precise as ultrasound, but they can get you pretty far. So the importance of a good physical exam was always there. Um, but these days, I mean, the standard of care is uh, to perform an ultrasound uh, prior to um, a procedural abortion um, and most medication abortions. Um, and in general, this is, you know, yeah, in general, uh, you can avoid this problem. I will also say that I think something in the language about of the question, I think it's a great question, but you know, if a woman lies about her due date to get an abortion, I mean, it's a little, um, it makes a lot of assumptions about what a woman might do, the risks that she mm -hmm. might put her own um, bodily health under in order to uh, get what she needs. And we know women will go to great lengths um, to get an abortion, even if it's not, uh, easy. Um, but generally, um, women, you know, we see, we see a lot of women and they don't do that. <laughs> I don't really think most of them do not realize how, uh, readily abortion, I mean, a uh, ultrasound could, um, could cut through that kind of, um, uh, misunderstanding. Um, but yeah, for, for whatever reason, I think, um, yeah, women aren't, they don't do much lying to us in, in the clinic. Um, they're pretty straightforward about what they need and they want safe medical care. Um, so yeah, there's an easy answer to this problem, but the, the real answer is it just doesn't happen. Yeah, I can see where one issue is, is this is where they're doing a lot of telemedicine now. And sometimes people just don't even know what their due date is, or maybe they're and obligatory most of the time, and they think they're 10 weeks and they're actually 15. But if you're doing this on telemedicine, uh, I could see where this could be an issue trying to estimate how far along they really are. Yeah, and that's where the importance of just good follow up comes in. And, um, you know, most of these telemedication abortion protocols um, rely pretty heavily on the woman having a very regular period and a very certain last menstrual period. 
Um, and again, women are pretty frank about that. If, if they can't tell you that they, um, that they're pretty sure, uh, they, yeah, they don't. Again, I'm used to dealing mostly with women in California. There may be different extremes that women are going to, and it wouldn't surprise me um, in other states now um, as their options become more and more limited. Have you, have you run into any different cultural issues around this field? Ooh, good question, Dave. What do you mean by cultural issues? Okay, so for example, um, where I practice in Fremont, you know, we have a large Muslim population, a large Latino population, a large Asian population. Have you seen any differences in how you coach patients culturally? Or, or it hasn't come up for you? I mean, I think this applies in any area of medicine. Again, you have to um, talk to the patient in front of you and respond as Prachi used the wonderful phrase, like, you know, mirror their language, um, mirror try, to the extent that you can, you know, the values and the world understanding that they are coming to their visit with. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's pretty similar in abortion care as in, in any other part of medicine. I mean, you know, different people come from different families and countries in the world where I know like they learn something different in kind of their everyday life than I did about um, how the body works in this way or how medicine works in that way. Um, but, you know, we have great translators to work through um, actual language barriers and the rest is really up to like very clear communication and um, patience and trust between the doctor and, and the patient. I, what would you add to that Prachi? Probably have a well, for me, the biggest problem was for patients who were in say in labor and for Muslim, many Muslim women seeing a male doctor was prohibited. And I almost had a, got into an Mtala issue on a patient who was potentially needed a repeat C-section and refused to have be examined. So again, I'm sure these things could happen in that field, in the abortion field as well, but it's just, you know, it's become a very diverse population in California here. And so there, I've just wondered if you've run into cultural issues. I know I certainly have in my practice on, in other areas of OBGYN as well. Um, so, can I just add to that, which is just that I think it's really impossible to characterize any one culture or group of people by any particular characteristic or patterns. And um, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's again, a patient's right to choose the type of care that they want. Um, and what we do as physicians is ideally tell them about their risks again, to bring up that fraught term, but to let them know our medical recommendations, right? And, and trust that um, they know their bodies um, and they know themselves, which I, I would like to think um, most folks do to make the decision that feels right to them and that we help them achieve the goal to the best of our ability for what they have for themselves. But I think, I think it gets liberated to start thinking about cultures as monoliths. Um, because oh, you have to, you have to, you're absolutely right. You have to individualize it. But um, we actually did a focus group on with Muslim women, which was very fascinating. And just an example of how variation can happen. We had these three young women from, uh, uh, I think it was Jordan. And one was dressed in all black and she would not let a man examine her under any condition. And then there was another woman who had a colorful hijab on and she would let a man examine her if her husband was in the room. And then the third sister was wearing uh, very colorful clothes and she didn't care who examined her. So even within that same family, we had a huge variation. So you're absolutely right. Uh, anyway, I didn't wanna get off track here. I got a couple more questions here for you. Um, are physicians leaving states that prohibit, prohibit abortions? I don't know the answer to that. I assume yes. Prati, do you know? I've seen some headlines saying that there may be some migration of, of physicians, but again, I've seen more information on the recent uh, decisions that people have made regarding match and where to go to medical school and residency. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll see more about that in the next few months. Yeah. So do you have any recommendations or resources for medical students who want to bring reproductive justice into medical curriculum? What a great question. Um, assuming this is a medical student in the audience. Well, 
Prati, do you want to start? I have some thoughts, but I might, I want to see what you say. Uh, my holy grail is um, Sister Song. Um, they are a wonderful organization um, based in the South um, and affiliated and, and kind of supporting so many other smaller community organizations that are doing incredible work, especially when it comes to reproductive justice work, reproductive rights and abortion rights. Um, in terms of actual recommendations or resources, much bigger question, feel free to reach out if you have specific questions, I'm happy to share. But uh, I think Loretta Ross, who's one of um, the people who helped start Sister Song, um, has many books on this topic. Um, that would be a great place to start and also recognizing that reproductive justice encompasses many things, including um, abolitionist medicine, um, thinking about how, especially right now, it's a great time to think about how medicine is also can function as an arm of um, the state, which is largely uh, this idea that how are we involved in policing uh, bodies and patients um, and how can we both acknowledge that the ways in which we do that, but also how do we stop doing that and help protect our patients um, and protect their rights. Um, but yeah, much longer, longer discussion, lots of thoughts and recommendations, but I'll pause there and, and let you go, Chris. Yeah, thanks. I was also thinking along the lines of books, because I don't know if Sister Song has like a specific, um, yeah, like resources specific to medical students and trainees. Um, it would be great if they do, um, but I think they also have like a lot of bigger fish to fry on the ground. Um, but I think uh, the um, Loretta Ross and Killing the Black Body was kind of the, in terms of reading material was sort of like the primer for me. Um, and on a like broader level, uh, books like White Scars, Brown, sorry, White Tears, Brown Scars, um, which is by an Australian author, but really applies um, to, yeah, to reproductive justice and broader, like similar issues of um, power differentials and the problems of white feminism, um, yeah, more broadly, um, which we really can apply to the abortion and reproductive justice discussions in this country too. Dorothy Roberts is also another person who takes a fairly academic take and gets a lot of data that uh, for those of us who are on social media um, can appreciate as things that get shared a lot in reproductive justice spaces. But if you read any of Dorothy Roberts' books, you'll um, find a lot of the data that's shared um, more widely. So we're coming up on six o'clock here. I would like to, there aren't any more other questions, so I would like to thank our two panelists here and Dr. Hennenberg for her great talk on this subject. Um, if I will leave it at that. Uh, any last thoughts from either of you? No, thanks so much, Dave and Prachi. It was wonderful to be here with you guys and yeah, to everyone who attended, thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you to the audience who, who participated in this very wonderful and interesting topic. So um, leave it at that. Thanks everyone.